go. All right, guys. So we're going to talk about rivers. Um, not that you can't catch muskies in lakes on flies. Obviously, you can. But we're going to talk about a little bit of river fishing today, tactics and strategies. So obviously, the first thing you're going to have to figure out is your location, right? Where are you in the country? That's going to change a lot of things about the river that you're fishing, whether it's a freestone river, a tailwater, um, whether it's just limestone everywhere, whether it's sand, muck, all that stuff plays into your tactics and strategies for that day. Um, I guess I should have started off with, uh, I've been guiding for, this is my 11th year, and I guide in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, and I used to guide in Tennessee for a lot of years. Um, that being said, I also did a lot of traveling east, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Kentucky, Virginia, West Virginia, North Carolina, and a lot of those places to fish. So I've been on some rivers that are complete apples and oranges to each other. You know, you've got the stuff in Wisconsin where you've got sand and you've got deep holes and things like that. And then you go to Tennessee and you've got ledges. And everything is that ledge rock stuff. And you're looking for cracks in the river rather than holes in the river. And, and things change. So, um, <clears throat> you know, that's, that's where I would start. What, what kind of topography do you have in your river? You know, are you looking at extremely fast water? Are you looking at dam releases? Are you looking at flows that are strictly dependent on the precipitation of the time of year? So all that has to do it. And then time of year. Obviously, um, you know, during musky season, uh, our musky season, which is in northern, I'm in the northern zone of Wisconsin, we're the last Saturday in May, now to ice up. Um, so, depending on time of year, I'm doing different things. I'm in different sections, I'm in different areas looking for specific things. Um, exactly the same thing if I'm in Tennessee, or I'm in Virginia, or Kentucky, or Ohio, or fill in the blank, right? You're looking for um, just those little, uh, like I guess you'd call them like idiosyncrasies, or little, little things that are going to help you start at the right point. So, for instance, um, if I'm in Tennessee, I'm not going to be looking, in the wintertime, I'm not going to be looking in shallow riffle water for muskies. That's not where they're going to be. They're going to be in, in the holes and things. Um, so, flow. Maybe something, if you're not used to fishing rivers, that's something that you have to watch. Flows can fluctuate CFS, which is cubic feet per second. And you can look at the USGS table online, and it'll tell you, as long as they have a gauge on that river, it'll tell you what the CFS is. Whether it's, you know, some rivers 200 and 250 CFS, as high as, you know, I fish rivers in Arkansas that are 30,000 CFS. So, you know, obviously that's high end of the spectrum and not ideal, but that's the fluctuation. And knowing that and keeping track of that stuff is really pivotal. Because you'll learn that, okay, a certain section of river at 250 CFS fishes really well. But if it jumps up to 500 or 600 or something like that, which could be the difference of a foot of water, two feet of water, depending, um, all that stuff is really pivotal and really stuff that you need to pay attention to. Um, not only for your safety, uh, <laughs> you know, but just for, um, you know, your ability to ca catch fish. Um, <clears throat> clear or dirty, that may be something that you're not used to if you're used to fishing lakes a lot. Some people see a dirty river and, and you know, it's, it's game over, right? That's not always the case. Um, you'll have tributaries that come in, you'll have sections that are um, further away from, from a tributary that's dumping in that's dirty that you can get away with fishing um, upstream of that and be in clear water, right? All that stuff is really important. and. It sounds simple once you, once you think about it, but it took me years to figure this stuff out. Um, inversely, you know, super clear water, we don't see a lot of in the north, right? We've got the tannic stains and things like that. If you go to Tennessee, you'll be fishing water. Sometimes it's as clear as the water that's coming out of your faucet. And that changes things. You know, whether the type of line that you want to use, you want to use a sinking line, you want to use an intermediate line, Maybe you have to use a little bit longer leader. You may have to change your approach. You know, in dirty water, you can get away with a 90 degree presentation and bring it right back to the boat like this, going down the bank or you're 
eddy or your mid-river structure, whatever it is, right? In super duper clear water, a lot of times you have to adjust. And we call, I joke around and call it fishing in the future. And what it means is I want you to cast 45 degrees downstream and I want that fish to see whatever your presentation is. It doesn't even have to be fly. This isn't strictly related to flies. If you're throwing lures, that's, it, it, it plays. Um, and, and, you know, the guy in the back of the boat is maybe not getting as, uh, is not able to do that. You know, it's, it's kind of hard to fish going this way as you're going down the river, right? So um, the guy in the front of the boat, I'm having him cast way, way out in front because I don't want those fish to see me. And you're talking about sometimes creeks or rivers that are as wide as this room. They know you're there when you're on top of them. <laughs> you know, I mean, you guys see how they react, you know, in a lake where there's, you know, miles of, of shoreline and they still know you're there. So that's important. And inversely, when the guy in the front is doing that, then I'll have the guy in the back face upstream and cast as far as he can upstream and bring the fly down. And what's that? That's going to do two things for you. It's going to give you one more shot through that hole, obviously, but it's going to give them a different look. And sometimes these fish, you guys have probably seen it, they'll bite something coming downstream or they won't bite something coming upstream. What I always think about <coughs> is a fleeing bait fish is not going to go up a treadmill to run away. You know, it's going to turn and go down and go downstream as fast as it can go. So, um, you know, that's, that's an important thing. Um, up, down, low, too slow, right? So, that has to do with your retrieve, your rate of retrieve, and, and just knowing like, okay, if my water's really cold, if I'm stripping it really fast and it's coming in on the surface, not probably gonna have great results, right? But if it's really cold, and I'm taking my time, and I'm getting that fly to go down and letting my line sink, and those feathers are going past the fish and they're tickling their face, a little bit more opportunity to maybe get a bite, right? Um, and, and inversely, in the summertime, if you're stripping really slow, and they're on a bucktail bite, or they're biting stuff going fast, and that fly's going real slow past, and they're going, you know, it's like fur and feathers, you know? So, um, that's really important, and it's just all um, part of putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And temperature, which I skipped over, temperature is huge. I would say it's the second thing that you need to be most concerned about behind flow. Because the temperature is going to dictate where the fish are, it's going to dictate how they behave, and, it, and at times it will dictate when your bite window is. Um, what I mean by that is like in the south, I always joke around and say that I don't even need to put my boat in the water until 1 in the afternoon because they don't bite in the morning. And they don't bite in the early afternoon, but as soon as that sun gets real high and it starts getting a little warmth on the water, you get those bite windows, right? And it's short. I noticed, um, excuse me, um, specifically in Tennessee is where I spent most of my southern time fishing, 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock, 3.30 sometimes. That was my window. And this is... You know, I spent seven years guiding down there all of winter. And I look back, I take meticulous notes every day, what time I caught them, where I caught them, blah, 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 blah. Looking through all that stuff, the majority of my fish were caught in that window. And I'm not a biologist, I can't tell you exactly why. I think a lot of it has to do with their metabolism and the way that they're able to break things down and they need heat to do that, just like a snake or anything else that's cold blood. But, um, yeah, so that's... That's huge, and it, that took me a long time to figure out. Um, and um, you know, a mentor of mine really pushed me in that in that way, and to really be paying attention to that thermometer. Now, a lot of times we're running boats that aren't as technologically advanced, is the nice way to say it, um, as maybe some boats that you're used to in the lakes, right? Like the big rangers out there and stuff like that. So I'm just hanging a the thermometer over the side. I put it around my oarlock, I throw the thermometer over the side, and in 10 minutes I look at it. I go, okay, you know, this, this is the temperature, and now I know what I need to do to adjust. The problem with that is that it's very hard to see the idiosyncrasies as you're going down the river. So you might be in 55 degree water all day, right? And then you go past a tributary, and if you're not paying attention, and you don't see that water then goes to 52 degrees or 
60 degrees or something like that, that's so important, so very important. Whether it's, it's summertime and it's hot and you've got cold water coming in, that's where they want to be, right? In the wintertime, some of those creeks in Tennessee that are blowing water in that's five, six degrees warmer, that is like night and day difference, okay? You'll have, you may have heard this term before and it's not something that I came up with, but 90% of the fish are in 10% of the water, right? You guys have heard that before? That's to a T what temperature does for you in the wintertime and inversely, you know, July, August, when it's really hot. So super, super important. Um, it's way easier to kind of keep track of that stuff if you do have a sonar unit because it's real time. You know, you're not having to wait for the thermometer to adjust and you're constantly looking at it. I can just look at a screen. So if I'm in my towy versus my drift boat, it's a little bit easier. But if you take one takeaway from this whole thing today, pay attention to temperature. And then obviously we're talking about flies today, but if you're approaching a new piece of water, it's going to be way easier for you and quickly more, you will learn it more quickly because you can cover water quicker with conventional tack. Now that may not be your favorite thing to do, that's fine, um, but in the interest of learning, sometimes, um, you know, me personally, my favorite way to catch muskies is on a fly. Absolutely. Do I gear fish? All the time. All the time. Because my quest for musty knowledge is greater than my want to do it the way that I want to do it. You know what I mean? So I may go to a new section of river and fish it with lures two or three times before I ever bust out my fly rod so that I can go, okay, now that I kind of have a little bit of an outline or, or kind of a a, well, yeah, an outline of, of kind of where I can break this all down. Now I can go and pinpoint them with a fly. Now I will tell you, do I think if I know where a fish is at 100%, I know that fish is sitting there, I would much rather throw my fly at it than I would a, a, a big lure in a river. Um, you know, superstition, maybe. I don't. I, that's not what it is to me. It's being able to present something to them in a way that is as natural as possible. If you're talking about a fish sitting in three feet of water and something that's only a hundred feet wide and you're going to throw a bulldog on top of them, that might freak them out, you know? So, and, and inversely, it might make them smash it too. Um, there's this really, this is not musty related, but it's, it's important. There's a kid in South Florida that is a giant snook magnet. This kid catches the biggest snook that I've seen in Florida, and he does it consistently, and he does it one way. He goes and catches giant mullets, and he rigs them up, and he sight fishes these giant snooks, snook, and he casts the mullet onto their freaking heads. And they either smash it, or they run away at 100 miles an hour. That's the only two responses that he gets. But I'm telling you right now, that kid crushes, and he's catching the biggest ones. So. Casting a bulldog on top of their heads? Yeah, sometimes they're going to smash it. How many times have you made a cast and moved the bait barely and you got a fish out? Happens all the time. Happens all the time with flies, too. So I'm not saying that it won't work. I'm just saying that a lot of times, especially if you're talking about pressured systems, a fly landing softly and then all of a sudden being in their zone of awareness before they knew that anything was going on and now all of a sudden here's some food, that can, that can be really pivotal to your success. Um, I guess, so I started musky fishing as a young kid with conventional tackle, and then the first time I went musky fly fishing and I saw a musky eat a fly, my head spun, and it didn't stop. I mean, it was exorcist all day, you know? And I was just like, they eat the snot out of this. This is so cool. And, you know, I was very, very lucky. I was with my buddy Tim Fisher. We went out fishing and we put three muskies in the boat the first time we ever musky fly fished. Luck, luck, right? Or maybe not, because it sent me down a path of poverty and being trailers. But, uh, <laughs> you know, um, it, it's, it's an incredible presentation and it's something that I really wish that every musky angler would pick up as a, uh, as a tool. But, so, 
Boats are important too when you're breaking down a river, right? If you're in a jet boat, you can do whatever you want. You know, as long as you're in a river that you can get from A to B and, and back and forth and do whatever, right? If you're in a drift boat, if you're in a canoe, if you're in a john boat, now you have to think about time management. You need to think about where you can go. You think about the miles that you can cover in a day. Um, and I'll tell you from a guy that's taken out in the pitch black more than once and hit every rock from when it got dark to the takeout, you know, you've got to be a little careful, right? And to be honest with you, it sounds silly, but this wasn't something that I was thinking about when I first started. I wasn't thinking about, okay, well, I've got nine miles to cover. I'm going one mile an hour or one and a half miles an hour at fishing speed. And I took a two-hour break up there to eat lunch and sit in the shade because it was hot. And now, you know, I'm taking out in the dark, right? So your boat is completely different than what you're going to be using in lakes. You need to be able to run shallow. If you're going to motor, you need to be really, really, really careful. Um, I've been in a boating accident on the river from full speed to upside down, and I can tell you it's not any fun. It's completely terrifying. It happens like that. It's so fast, and there's nothing that you can do. You know, 28 miles an hour to upside down. And nobody got hurt too bad, but we, you know, could have died. So, okay, really breaking it down. Deeper shallow. It's time of year. You know, time of year and temperature. Are they going to be up shallow in, in, in the sand flats? Or are they going to be down in the deep holes? And now a lot of times, I can tell you in the south, in the wintertime, there's not one fish in the shallow water, right? But inversely, up here in the north, in the fall, when the water starts getting cold and you think, okay, everything's going to start holding up, that's not always the case. These fish will climb up so shallow, you'll be so surprised. And they'll be sitting in water that barely covers their back, and they're just sitting in there baking. And that's it. Whether they went and ate a sucker or whatever they ate, and they're, they're using that, that heat to help aid their digestion, that happens a lot. Another thing that happens is they'll move up to warm up to get to a certain temperature and then feed. Um, that is mind-blowing, okay? And the reason why I know that is because Larry Dahlberg told me that, and the reason he knows that is because he took a thermometer and tempted him, okay? He saw in, in um, pike fishing situations, which is not a muskie, but it's the same thing in, in this scenario. It's the same, right? Fish that he could get to eat were at the same temperature as the water. Fish that he could not get to eat, that he got however he got to temperature them, were not the same temperature as the water. They were colder. That's, to me, mind-blowing, right? That's a piece of information that I never would have got because I never would have thought to take a thermometer and, and a pike's butt, you know? So um, it's, it's really cool, and, and it has a lot to do with, um, with you know, everything that you piece together from that point on. Fast or slow, I'm talking about retrieve, and I'm also talking about water speed. Sometimes they're in water that's so fast and, and ripping that you're like, there's no way that there's a 25-pound fish sitting in that, in that current, but they are. And a lot of it has to do with bait, and a lot of it has to do with time of year and temperature. Again, you're going to hear me repeat myself a lot, time of year and temperature, time of year and temperature, time of year and temperature, because it is the catalyst to what we are doing. Um, it tells you exactly where the fish are, just like in, in lakes where you're like, okay, all these fish are related to weed beds, they're on, they're on the weed lines or they're tucked way into the weeds or they're up so shallow or they're on the deep reefs or whatever. You know, it's all, it all plays, right? Um, sometimes these fish will not respond to a slow stripped fly. So you'll see, you may have seen it before, where you cast out you put the rod underneath your armpit and you start two hand stripping, right? And it's our equivalent, it's our only way to burn a bucktail. That's what we're trying to do. Late July, early August, when those fish want something moving fast and they will not respond to something moving slow, and that's how you get them. And it works really well and it's pretty fun. Um, there's a little bit of a learning curve. Um, the key to that is never stop. Fish eats it. Just keep going, hand over hand, boom, 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 boom. And then all of a sudden you're getting to the point where you can't pull anymore. 
Then you can get your rod and start going back to your normal grip and, and doing what you need to do to fight the fish. The biggest disconnect that I see with this guiding when I'm teaching people how to do this is they freeze, right? They're stripping, the fish eats it, oh, the fish ate it. Well, you got to do something. If you sit there, it's going to spit it out, you know? So, um, we'll cover strip sets and all that stuff too, which uh, if you guys have been fly fishing, you know all about that stuff. But I would say that's the number one disconnect, whether you're two-handed, one-handed, figuring, whatever. The hook set is where the problems start, you know? Or, you know, the problem starts is trying to get one of these fish to be fly. But, um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a big thing. Rapids. Rapids are often overlooked, you know? Oh, I gotta go through this thing and it's, it's heavy current and there's a lot going on here. And that couldn't be more true. There's a lot going on in the rapid. There's bait fish, there's confusion, there's cover. All that moving water, all that white water, that's just the same as a down tree or a dock piling or anything else. That's all covered. And they use that. Um, same thing with a riffle. Anytime you've got broken up surface, that's, that's in my mind, just as good as a down tree. That is just as good as ambush cover as something that's sitting static in the water that they can kind of hide behind. Took me a while to figure that out. Um, Casting through riffles and things like that. Uh, casting through water where I feel like standing, I can see across the river and I can see the rocks and I can go, okay, there's no fish through here. Oh, they're there. And, uh, you know, just because you can't see them, they make a living not being seen. You know, that's their whole thing, is sitting there not being seen and then something comes up and gets them. I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting in the rower seat and I'm telling guys to cast over stuff and they're kind of like, really? Like, you want me to fish over this stuff with a sinking line and it's a foot of water and there's shit? Yeah, do it. And all of a sudden, <laughs> blows up and there's no water. And I can tell you, there's not much more of a fun muskie than a muskie that's got nowhere to go. Because he goes up. You know, and you got this thing cartwheeling through the rapids and jumping and doing all kinds of fun stuff. And uh, as far as visually pleasing goes, there, there's not much better. So we covered rapids and riffles, holes. So... If you fish rivers, obviously you're going to be seeing the bottom, and then all of a sudden, you're not going to see the bottom. That would be a hole. A hole can be 4 feet deep in certain rivers, or a hole can be 20 feet deep in certain rivers, depending on your topography and your location. In Tennessee, it's not, in Virginia, it's not uncommon to see 20 feet, you know? Whereas in Wisconsin, um, on our little rivers, 20 feet is not, you know, maybe one spot in the whole river might be 17 or 18 feet or something like that. And it'll be maybe the size of this room. And then everything else is going to be 3 feet, 2 feet, 4 feet, 5 feet. Deep hole might be 6 feet. Um, you know, stuff like that. Holes can be utilized in different scenarios. If it's really, really hot out, sometimes they're in the holes and they're way in the bottom. In different trips where it's, where it's cooler. Um, in the southern part of the world, in the winter time, if you are not fishing in the holes, you are not fishing. You are wasting your time everywhere else because every fish in those systems are in the deep water. And there's two reasons for that. Anybody have a guess of the first reason? Temperature? How long? There you go. It's bait. That's where everything's at. That's where all your suckers are, your fall fish, your chubs, your dace, whatever it is. You're talking about smallmouth muskies walleyes, whatever, everything is in there. Um, how do I know that? Because I spent so much time fishing in the wrong spots, <laughs> not seeing anything, right? And then you go, and places like Virginia, for instance, where their, um, their version of the DNR will go in and shock these holes, and there'll be 20 fish in a spot as big as this room. Whereas you'll go a mile down the river, and there's not a fish anywhere until you get to the next hole. And then there's another 15 or 20 fish. I think one of the holes, I don't quote me on this, but I think one of them had like 50-something muskies in it. What? Like, that's insane. You don't think about that, right? When we think about muskies, we think about solitary predators and, and you know, oh, they're not supposed to be sitting together, and maybe if they do, it's just one or two or whatever. That many? 
I mean, anything over a dozen is a lot, right? I mean, it's insane. But that's that's the way those things set up, and, and that works the same way in Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee. Um, all that plays the same way. Whether you're in a small little creek or you're in a big river like the New River, for, exa for example, that's really big, comparable to um, maybe like the Mississippi or the Lower St. Croix around here. It's that big. And, and so, um, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll have miles and miles of river where there's nothing. So trips, trips come into play more often than you think. Temperature and clarity are the two things that, that are important for your tributaries, right? So you have a weather event. Whether your weather event is, uh, for instance, last year in this area, lack of weather, right? We didn't get any rain. We had minimal flows almost the whole season. But you get to a point where you have a tributary coming in and you've got a bump of CFS of maybe 100 or 200. And now you go from a river that's 250 CFS to 450 CFS. That's a lot. That's a ton, you know? Um, and temperature plays a big key. In the wintertime, if that water's coming in warm, that's where everything's going to be. Whether it's your bait or your predators, they all got to be in that area. Um, and uh, I'll tell you a story here. A couple years ago, I was fishing with a buddy of mine, and he told me, you know, I saw this ginormous fish at this trickle. And I mean, I'm talking about probably a little bit of water, maybe about this wide, coming into the river, and you can see it coming in, right? But it was freezing cold, freezing cold groundwater. And the, the river temperature was in the 70s. Well, you're looking at that, and you're looking down this whole shoreline, and there's cover here, there's cover here, there's all this awesome wood and, and, a, and a slide that came in, and you're like, oh man, they've got to be set up here, they've got to be set up here, there's got to be here. They're not. They got their nose in that cold water, and that's where it's sitting. And I had this enormous muskie, 50 plus inch fish, in just the smallest little piece of water, smash right where that comes in. Cast a fly to it, strip once, you know, I didn't catch it, because you know, sadness, but, um, but you know, that's exactly where it was. And if I could show you the guys in the spot, there's no way that any one of you, I wouldn't, maybe you would, pick that's where it was sitting. Because there's so much awesome wood up here, and there's so much awesome wood down there, and you've got all this other stuff. There's so much better things to be an ambush point for a predator to sit, but that's not where it was. Um... We, we touched on this a little bit earlier. You get a weather event and the river starts getting dirty. Um, a lot of times, the main river will stay clean and what's dirtying the river is these tributaries because you've got all this runoff coming into them. So if you can get above a certain tributary, there'll be a mixing point and that's just as good as cover. You've got clear water and you've got mud and you've got a mixing point and that mixing point that's that line of dirty water, which could be as clear as looking at this table to the floor, this is where they're at. And they're sitting in that dirty side, and they're looking out into that clean side. And as soon as something comes by, and I've seen that uh, an awful lot. Um, and bait. So it doesn't matter how good the spot looks. If there's nothing there to eat, there's nothing there to eat that. So... A lot of times people will get caught up in fishing where they want to fish rather than where they need to fish. Um, I've caught fish in this spot t tons of times. I've been down this river 30 times in the last two years and, and almost every time I see a muskie in this spot. But the water's low, might not be a good spot. The water's high, might not be a good spot. If it's cold, if it's hot, if it's this or it's that. You know, if you're on a weird moon phase. Whatever you want to blame it on, but they're not there. You need to move, you need to adjust, you need to go look. You need to keep moving and find the bait. Because I can tell you, as good of a spot is, if there's not a pot of suckers living adjacent to it or close to it, there will not be big predators. You might catch some smaller muskies, which is cool. You know, you might, you might get into that. But to truly catch a very big muskie, there has to be a few things. There's got to be deep water adjacent to where they're feeding so that they can go feel safe. You'll see a very big muskie in no water, for sure, but they need a place to go when they're not eating where they can go hunker down and not be worried about death from above. Because somebody said this to me a long time ago, 
Um, a really, really good musky angler, uh, his name is Mike Holbert, he guides on Lake St. Clair, he's been doing it for a very long time. He said something to me that really resonated with me that I've thought about a lot since he said it to me. A musky does not know how big it is, right? Sounds silly, but it's once you start thinking about it, it makes a lot of sense, right? So for a 50-inch muskie to be sitting in the same spot as a 36-inch muskie is very possible. But it doesn't know that those eagles that tormented it its whole life when it was growing up can't eat it now, you know? So they will not sit in that for a long period of time if they're not comfortable. So when you start catching fish in small rivers that are 48 inches and bigger, you will notice that almost every single time there's deep water adjacent to where that fish was at. Whether it's as close from me to you away, or it's me that flagpole away, it's going to be, they're going to be able to get to it quickly. Um, that has played out almost 100% tr truthfully um, in, in the last decade of me doing this. There, there's got to be that for, for really truly big fish. Isn't deep also relative, Chris? You know, if you're in the two to three foot, 100 yard long section, very much so. Four and a half foot. Very Four much so. deep. And that's, that's relative to your location, too. Like we talked about earlier, deep water in Wisconsin is not the same thing as deep water in Virginia or Tennessee or North Carolina. You know? Um, what, what I think the point that you're making is that if you have a long section of river that's a mile long of sand flats, like you see a lot in the St. Croix where you're just going for, for a mile and it's just sandy nothingness, deep water adjacent could be four feet of water at the end of that or at the beginning of that, right? Um, whereas, like, you're probably not going to see that big girl up on those sand flats in the middle of nowhere because something bad happens. It can't quickly escape. Um, we give these fish a whole lot of credit, and a lot of times they're way smarter than me, right? But they're not. They're very predictable in the way that you can kind of see these patterns develop and, and kind of, kind of um, you know, uh, use that to your advantage. So patterns, patterns are something that you need to keep track of. I told you guys I take meticulous notes about, especially my southern fishery, I can tell you that the majority of my fish were caught between 1 o'clock and 3.30. That's pattern. And that's stuff that no one can teach you. No one can show you. No one can tell you. That stuff that you have to put together on your own because it's a fishery that maybe you fish a creek that I don't fish, and that's different, you know? So, nerd out as much as you can, you know, and, and take those meticulous notes or, or try to keep track. Um, keep track of those patterns, keep track of your movements, and your time management, okay? Time management, we touched on a little bit earlier, is huge on breaking down river systems. If I move a fish in the first hour of a nine mile float, I cannot, it, depending on my boat, a lot of times, especially in our rivers where we're running drift floats, A to B floats where I can't go back and forth, people ask a lot of times, what's the, what's, what's the big difference between lakes and rivers, lakes and rivers? One of the biggest ones that I can tell you as far as technique wise is I can't go back on those fish. I can't go, okay, well I moved a really big one in that eddy this morning and moon is at 3.30 and at 3.30, I'm gonna go be set up in that hole and I'm gonna go get them. That's not how it works. So you need to know that from point A to point B on a river float, I've got 18, call it, good spots on the river that I know that there's muskies at those spots. So if I'm looking at moon, or if I'm looking at low light periods, or patterns that, okay, I've seen between this time and this time I've been catching fish, that's all part of your time management and it sounds silly, but it has to be in your head when you're on the river because you can't really get anywhere quickly um, in a lot of our rivers. So you have to be like, okay, well, I know I'm in this hole and it takes me an hour and a half to get to this one. And if I want to fish this spot and this spot, then, you know, I don't have time to drop the anchor and have a sandwich real quick. I got to huck and I got to get down to my spot, fish this spot, fish this spot, and then I'll be in my spot when it's time. Um, we talked about earlier about me taking out in the dark a bunch of times, and I did do that, man. And I dinged up a lot of boats and, and uh, upset some girlfriends and things like that. But, you know, um, it's, it's important. It's important to keep track of that stuff way more so than other places.
Um, so, real quickly, I just want to talk about a couple of things that I see guiding that are disconnects that you can improve on that shouldn't be um, shouldn't be a factor, right? You talk about you talk to old time guides and they tell you control the things you can control and try to manage the things that you can't, right? So. In musky fishing, there's a lot that we can't control. I can't control them biting. I can't control catching multiple fish in a day. I can't control their ability to play, their willingness to play the game. But what I can control is that when that fish comes in, I'm making the right movements at the boat to increase my odds of success. So every time I move a fish, every time I, I have an opportunity, I do the things that I need to do correctly to then try to put that fish in the boat. And one of them is figuring downstream. We talked about it earlier, a fish that's scared is not going to go up a treadmill to run away from something. It's going to go down, fast as it can get away. I've seen so many times where people come in to do a figure eight, they turn it upstream first turn and that fish books it. Whereas if you turn and go downstream, as soon as that fly or lure, whatever it is, makes that turn to go downstream, something in that fish tells it it's got to eat it because it's going to get away. That is so important, and it sounds little and it sounds silly, but downstream turns, downstream turns, downstream turns. Whether you're in the back of the boat, the front of the boat, the middle of the boat, I don't care. Downstream. Um, another thing that I see a lot is people that will like to drag the fly on the surface on a figure eight. That almost never works. You need to bend over, put your rod in the water, get that fly below the surface, what I always like to do is think about it like this, right? So here's my boat in the water. Here it is. If my fly is here, I'm looking at boat and I'm looking at some goofy guy trying to catch me. But if I've got it down here and I'm figuring down here, well now that fish sees a river. It sees what it always sees. Something trying to get away from it without this big obtrusive object or a guy, you know, swizzling a stick in the water. So that's really important. Another really important thing, a lot of musky fly rods these days, you'll see almost all of them have this extended butt. This um, extended butt is not aesthetic. It is purpose driven, okay? It's for your backhand. When you're backhanding, you're gonna post this against your forearm and you're gonna use this all in one fluid motion, just like this, right? And the reason for that is so that you don't break your wrist and you don't wear yourself out. Um, a lot of people don't like the backhand. It's my favorite cast because it doesn't hurt. Simple as that. You're doing this all day, it's, you're going to feel it, you know? But as soon as you start doing this and you start letting the rod do the work and let everything else do the work, then all this is just barely moving your arm and it doesn't hurt at all, okay? So that's important. And then when you're figure eighting, it's very important that you have the line, your fly line, in both hands, okay? And the back, the back has to be holding it just like this so that when a fish eats, you're not trying to find it. If you're trying to find it, you're in trouble because you've lifted. You're already out of the game. If you're lifting to try to set a hook with a fly rod, it's very rarely going to end in your favor. Um, you'll have the fish for a short time and What's going to happen is, is you're not going to get it through the bar, you're not going to get penetrated to the bend. That fish is eventually going to open its mouth or come at you with its mouth open and the fly just pops out. So it would be like, I see a lot of guys in the conventional tackle world, you know, where they're doing a figure eight and they might have their hand off the reel and you've got one hand on the rod. Now, if you're a good angler, you might be able to get away with that, right? But there's going to be situations where you want to be able to control your reel. You need to gain line. You need to push your button and thumb. You need to do that stuff. When you set the hook, I guess like the way to equate it to conventional tackle fishing would be figure eight like this, you know, with no hands on the rod at all. Because the only way that you're going to set the hook is with your, um, if you're right handed, your left hand. If you're left handed, your right hand. You've got to pull the line. So very, very important mechanically that you have both hands with line in it. Um, you'll notice on this particular rod, this is a rounded butt end. So when you're figure eight, it's in your palm and it's real smooth. It's very easy to make these big movements. 
Um, that's really nice, you know, when you're doing it a million times a day. Um, it's harder to make the eight with a fly rod, right? Because the rod folds, it's not stiff. So I try to teach the oval, you know, teach their own, six to one, half dozen the other, right? But it's a lot easier to control the stuff with the oval, especially on the outside turns, which is where you're going to get bit a lot, right? You'll know from conventional tackle fishing, when you do that outside hang, that's where you get bit a lot. When you cross through and dig down, that's where you get bit a lot. It's way easier to do that with two hands with a fly rod than it is with one, and to keep that fly moving. A lot of times, you'll see people with a figure eight, and they'll kind of pause that fly because of the hang, and that's really good. Um, but more often than not, you see them kind of, hmm, I don't want that anymore, you know? So fluidity, keeping it moving, all that stuff is really, really important. Do um, you feel like people sometimes go too deep, too? Sometimes you can scrape the rod on the bottom, and I hear that, <laughs> and I'm thinking, ah. But, you know, and that noise, just that, will sometimes spook them. Or hitting the rod against the side of the boat will spook them. Or, you know, a lot of times you see people get excited, you know, and, and that, when you're in a fiberglass boat that's got nothing in it, it's a fiberglass wall, and that's it. This is very, very loud to those fish, or kicking the side of the boat and stuff like that. I always tell people to stop dancing. Stop dancing. They don't want to dance with you, you know? Really important stuff. Um, conversely, so the the biggest disconnect of, of sadness is the strip set, right? If you are constantly setting with the rod, it's never going to work. It's, it's, you know, that's not true. It, it might work occasionally. But the biggest thing, the biggest thing is hammering those strip sets. Two, three, four of them. Whatever it takes to get to the point where that fish, you're not moving it anymore. And then you can go, okay. And then you can lift up. And then you can kind of start giving them the business with the rod, right? Um, you know, it's, it's a completely different game this is the 12 weight, so it's going to be a little bit stiffer. But you're not looking a lot with that, right? It's just too bendy. So this, as far as musky fly rods goes, this is a 12 weight. This is stiff, you know. Um, 11 weight version, a little bit softer, and then um, inversely, other other companies' rods and stuff like that, softer yet or stiffer still, but 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 not not really. This is about as stiff as it gets. And you're you're not hammering hook sets home, and you're not you're not doing what you need to do. And honestly, you can be in the right spot. You can do all that other stuff that I that I was talking to you guys about, paying attention to temperature and location, and you can be on them, and you can be in a spot with a bunch of fish. But that little step right there, that big strip set, if that's where you disconnect, then you're going home without a without a fish. You guys have any questions? I kind of just been talking at you for an hour here. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more? And I'm sorry, I tried to get here in time. You might have covered this in the beginning, but um, like, just in ideal situation, like, help us visualize a little bit. Like, if you felt like a muskie was sitting on a particular river spot, um, how you would position your boat in relationship to the current, where you'd want the fly to land. But then, let's just say it follows all the way to the boat, and then. Um, how you would execute the like the when you talked about like turning it, you know, with the currents or going, yeah. going downstream, like explain like that concept in relationship to starting with landing on the cast, how the fish is coming in, where the boat is. And yep. I know. I mean, I know it's going to be hard to explain. No, no, no. But, like, I, I totally understand what you're asking. So, let's say perfect scenario. You've got a beautiful eddy coming up on river left, right? And you're coming in. And you can see it. And you're going to approach the boat with the boat. Ideally. My boat is as far as my cast allows me to be away from that spot so that I've got more runway, you know? Now, if you are casting with a musky fly rod 75 feet, that's pretty far, you know? That's a very nice cast, and that was 10% of my client base can do that. So 
a lot of times you're inside that 50 feet or more, right? And that's also good because fly line itself has a tremendous amount of stretch. So if I'm too far away and that fish eats, it's going to take me five big pulls before I'm completely tight to that fish. So if, if applicable or if available, you know, if the situation is, is right, I can be a little bit closer. Um, but it's not like conventional tackle or, or something where you want to, you want to like, you can, you can get them on the, on the very first strip of the far cast. You might be able to, but it's going to be difficult. You want to approach, um, so you're casting in front of you. I, I'd like my, my front angler to be on that 45 down, and I can fish that area before my boat gets there. I like to break eddies down into A, B, C, right? You've got the A spot, you've got the B spot, and you've got the C spot, okay? And it's not A, B, C. It's actually A, C, B. The very first spot, the most active fish in an eddy, in my experience, is going to be at the head of the eddy. So, I'm coming down the river, right? And my whole eddy is like this. A. Is this river by, like, see the grain of the floor? Yeah. Can we, like, use that as a, will that work? Like, sure. I mean, like, that's the way the current is going. Sure, so the current's going this way. It's going towards you guys. Yep. I'm approaching it this way. My eddy's on the left side, and I've got A, C, B, right? A is the first spot of the eddy where there's no current, adjacent to the current. So suckers are going to swim by, and they're either going to duck into the eddy to get out of the current, or they're going to ride that seam and go down. And that fish is going to either come out and hit them at that seam or in the main river, or they're going to wait for them to come in and, and hit them there, right? And that's the, in my experience, when you see the explosive eats where the fly lands and they just smash it, no holds barred, that's almost always where that fish is sitting, is at the head of the eddy. Now, the C spot, the second spot that you're going to fish, which may not be the most productive spot, right? Your first spot is the most productive. Your B spot will be the second spot. The C spot is going to be the most dead spot in the eddy, which is usually the, the furthest back in the middle of the eddy, where there's just no current. You'll see a leaf sitting there not even moving, right? Or stagnant kind of river junky stuff on the surface. That's a lazy fish. That's a fish that's completely complacent with sitting there. It might be warming up. It might be warming up to eat. It might have ate something already and it's digesting it. Whatever it is. That fish is harder to catch. It's in the right spot, but it's in a spot that's, you know, it's going to be a muskie. It's probably going to follow. It's going to show you itself, but it's not going to bite, you know. And then the B spot, the secondary best spot, is the very last part of the eddy before it kicks out into the current. And a lot of times they're sitting there because whatever's in the eddy, that's the last point it can be in the eddy before it goes back out in the main current and goes wherever it's gonna go. Um, so that's how I would break down an eddy. If I was breaking down a shoreline that was just full of cover, a lot of downed trees, that's uncover the cup until you find the pee. You know, you're just gonna keep looking until you see where it's sitting. There might be a situation where you've got a shoreline that's uh, there's no gradient and it's four and a half feet for a hundred yards and you've got down trees you know every 15 yards or 20 yards in a perfect world that sounds like a great spot but you know you, you got to pick apart each piece and a lot of times just like in a lake where it's the furthest point that sticks out or the furthest piece of cover that sticks out that's where they're going to be in the river that can be the case but they can also be tucked in so tight. I remember this one time on the Mississippi I was fishing, and it was a group trip, we were bass fishing, my bass buddies are in front of me. They had a muskie come out and try to eat a bass, right? And they're hollering back, I got a water, the muskie over here. And I'm like, okay. So I have one fly rod with me and set up for muskie fishing, and it's a big, long stick that's sticking out, right? Big, long tree. And you would think that that fish would be at the end of that tree, where the deepest water is, and they still got covered. I cast it to where that tree just met the water coming off the, the, the bank, and that fish beached itself when it ate my fly. Cool. <laughs> right? <laughs> Super cool. And that taught me something, too. You know, it wasn't where I thought it was going to be. It was so tight because it happened like that. The fly landed, I stripped it once, kaboom, the fish is on, on the shore. You know, like, 
taught me something very, pretty, pretty cool there. So a lot of time a little bit, but I hope that kind of answered your question a little bit. Yeah, and the second part would just be, um, again, maybe we could use the analogy of just like the, the currents going in the direction of the grain of the floor. Um, if that fish is coming in and following you, and you're going to try to use that current to your advantage with your boat side technique, can you, can so you explain that a little bit? It's important for the person on the oars or on the trolling motor to be done. Oars come up, push them down, blades out of the water. I've seen more out, more than once, and every person that I guide with, more than once, they bite the oar. It's no bullshit. Happened to you, Jay? Oh yeah. So that lucky wasn't very happy. Yeah, dude. And so lucky, who he's talking about, is my one of my best friends and one of the guys that guides with me all the time. And. Uh, I mean, I can't tell you, we've all had it happen to us so many times. So it's important, oars out of the water, right? And then the next thing is that you want to make that turn as, as far as you can control it away from the boat. So as that fish is coming in, as soon as you feel like you have control, which is literally the length of line of this table, anything more than that, you have no control. When you go to do a turn, you've got too much, that's honestly too much. Because when you go to do that turn, you're going to start that turn and your fly is going to be sitting stagnant because it's not caught up to you, right? So it's important, I use a level leader. So it's a 40-40 leader, I've got 40 pound fluorocarbon to 40 pound wire and my whole leader setup is roughly 3 feet to 40 inches. And I hear that first click, my knot come into the guide and that's where I'm at, right? And ideally I can leave that much line out so I don't have a knot on my guide. But do it, right? And sometimes that click, especially I've seen it in Tennessee where the water is as clear as the water that you drink, that click, they don't like it. Gone. So um, you want to transition as soon as you can, as soon as you have control, and it's always important to go downstream. We talked about that. That downstream kick will get you that immediate bite more than the upstream kick. A lot of the times that upstream, they go downstream. They just chew, no way. So, um, it's just playing it to the best of your ability, keeping them as far away from you as possible. I always joke around and say fly rods are nine feet long, use the whole nine feet for figure eighting and for casting. If you're casting a musky fly rod like this, it's bad. You're going to wear one and it hurts. Out here, keep the fly nine feet away from you. Um, wherever your tip travels is where your line travels, which is invert, you know, where your fly is gonna travel. So if you're out here, that's where it's gonna go. If you're up here, that's where it's gonna go. So use the whole nine feet, try to keep it away. Level changes are huge. You know, it's easy to do with a gear rod, right? Because you dig it down and there's no stretch and there's no bend in the rod. So if I push this rod down in the water two feet, my bait goes down two feet. Whereas with a fly rod, with a buoyant fly, I put my rod down two feet, my fly might only be under the water eight inches. You know, so it's important to just make sure that when you're coming in, that fly is as deep as you can have it as you're coming in. And then as you transition, bend down a little bit, bend your knees and get that out away from you and down away from you. Because it's going to be the best chance that you get to fool in that fish and eat it. You have a question? When you're fishing in Tennessee clear water, are you using the same flies as you're using up here, or are you changing that up? A lot of times I'm using the same patterns, but I'm using different colors. So a color that I would very rarely use in northern Wisconsin waters or northern Minnesota waters is like a purple gray white. Just not something that I would use here. Whereas that's one of my go-to colors in Tennessee because it looks good in that clear water. Um, does this natural colored sucker looking fly look really good in dark water? Sure does. Does it look really good in clear water? Sure does. So, you know, you can use that stuff. Whereas like, you know, if it's super, super clear, 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 am I going to use bright chartreuse? Probably not. But, you know, I used to be a real big color guy and my buddy Larry kind of got me out of that. And it's more about what it does, where it's at in the water column, how it, how it performs, more so than what color it is. Similar sizes though? I use a lot smaller stuff in the south. Um, except
except for that's Tennessee, and it, it's based on forage, right? If they're eating small shad, then they're eating small shad, and that's what they eat, and that's what they're used to eating. So it's going to be easier for them. It's going to be easier for me to trick them with a six-inch fly rather than throwing a game changer that's 14 inches long and it hurts like a mother of cats, <laughs> you know? So um, now. If you guys follow me or, or, or keep track of what I do a lot, this is the color that I like a lot, right? Yellow, white, and black. Um, I think it's so versatile. I think it looks like a sucker. I think it looks like a walleye. I think in certain times it can be the right profile for a shad, so it doesn't matter what color it is. Um, it can look like a dace. You know, the fall fish in the south, you know, a lot of those places, um, Virginia, for, for example, the fall fish are olive and, and pink. So, olive and pink, that's weird. I wouldn't use that up here, but it crushes down there. And then we started using pink and chartreuse up north, and as you can see, I've got a lot of it. It's one of my, one of my go-tos. Um, the very first muskie that I caught in Tennessee was a double, on a double nickel, which is this style of fly. It's got aluminum sea eyes in the head. It's just absolutely nothing spectacular. It's a standard musky fly, Buford style fly, fur flash, fle fur flash feathers all the way through. The only thing that's different is the head. And just adding that little bit of aluminum in the head starts to get that thing to do a little bit more down dips and up, you know, and, and less up dips. Like as a straight uh, deer hair head with no aluminum or, or lead eyes in the head, you're gonna get more of this and some of this, right? This fly doesn't do this that much. It kind of does this. And it just, it's, it's just a little bit different. But my first ever fish in Tennessee was on a double nickel in this color. And that's my go-to fly in northern Wisconsin too. So it's, it's just, I don't know, I guess it's a toss-up. And I also feel like whatever you're confident in, you're gonna fish that to the best of your ability. If you're like, man, I never catch any fish on chartreuse, and you're fishing a chartreuse fly because for whatever reason you think it's going to work, and you're kind of, yeah, this might work. But if you're like, okay, stripping it, I'm seeing it turn, let it hang, let it pause, now I'm stripping it again, it's doing what I want it to do, like I'm real confident in my fly pattern or my color, I'm fishing it. It's as simple as that. So, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the you know, I joke with anybody that fishes with me, you know, what color you're using, oh, I think I'll try pink. 90% of my fish are probably pink, but that's because I'm fishing you're pink 90% of the time. I'm pink, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's true with anything. So, um, you know, you see a big trend, and I don't want you guys to, to get caught up in this too much. You see a really big trend with throwing as big a fly as you can possibly throw. That's not necessary, you know? One of the cool things about fly fishing is that they'll eat something like this. You know, this is a Dahlberg Mega Diver. This is probably the easiest fly that you could possibly cast in my box. And I would put this on an intermediate line and fish it off a bubble trail or a floating line. I could put this on a sinking line and fish it down and then watch it kind of come back up. You could fish this, arguably I wouldn't, um, but you could fish this fly all year round and just change your fly line, and you would still catch some fish. You know, um, there's times of year when the water's really cold that my back angler, um, I guess if you don't know, that usually I, I'm two people, that's it. I can't guide three people, I can do one or two. So a lot of times when the water's really cold, it's that later time of year, my back angler, my guy going through the whole second, is catching a lot of fish. And the reason for that is, is because we talked about this a little bit earlier with angles, right? I got my front guy casting downstream, and he's bringing the fly kind of up and across the current. That's good, but that's, you're only going to be able to achieve so much depth with that because you've got lift from the current pulling your fly and pulling your line up. Whereas the guy in the back seat, um, the guy in the back is casting upstream. Now, 
you got the most buoyant fly, most deer hair head packed fly that you could possibly tie. It, if you're casting upstream on the sinking line, that fly is going down. And it's because the current, as it pushes it downstream, is also pushing it down in the water column. And you've got 450 grains of tungsten sink line also getting pushed down. So now all of a sudden, your fly that normally out of the front of the boat would be maybe a foot below the surface is now three, four, five feet below the surface and ticking the bottom. I talked about this in an article I wrote recently about how when we first started musky fly fishing, the flies that we were using are very similar to just this fly right here, just the double Buford. Now, if you get good at tying musky flies, you can tie this fly in probably a half an hour, 25 minutes. And this is a pretty big one and it's pretty fully tied, but you could get away with a much sparser one and a much, much quicker tie. And I was braver with those flies. I snag it on the bottom, oh well, sucks, but I'm not gonna cry about it, you know? But I snag a fly that took me an hour and a half with 14 shanks and two hooks and super Google eyes and you know, whatever kind of super, super stuff's on it. Well, now I'm upset because I lost it. So I'm not fishing it as bravely as I would fish a fly that, okay, I'm making bottom contact. And that's key, especially in those colder temperatures. And, oh, I snag. Okay, roll back, get it, get it unstuck, got it back. I honestly can't tell you the last time I lost a fly just because of, uh, you know, learning the rivers a little bit more and, and kind of being on people. Like, hey, speed up. You know, blah, blah, blah. But I will tell you that when you're getting snagged on the bottom in the fall, you're doing it right, you know. And one of those snags is not going to be the bottom. All of a sudden, you're going to be like, it's swimming, you know, and, and, and things are going to change. So, um, Back of the boat in the fall, super key, front of the boat, rest of the time of the year, maybe, maybe the better spot. Um, we didn't talk about lines that much, so there's three kinds. Floating line, used minimally, if, if ever, I don't even think I, last year was the lowest water I've ever seen on the river. Um, been up there for a decade. I still wasn't using a floating line. Um, intermediate, one, one 1.25 inches per sink rate per second. You, you, you hear about sink rate per second, and that's what it means. Um, on a lot of these lines, you can look online and it'll give you a chart where it'll tell you the grain weight, it'll tell you how fast it sinks, all that stuff. This is a 450 grain um, sinking fly line with a floating runner. So it's got 25 foot head of tungsten coated line that's going to sink. And then your running line, you'll see. Uh, in the transition here. The, the fly line's green, and then the sinking portion is black. A lot of you guys know this. But the, the black part is the sinking part, and that's what's gonna sink. And that green line is gonna stay on the surface, which is really important for shallow, rocky rivers like we fish in this part of the world. Um, if you're gonna go to Tennessee, uh, Kentucky, West or regular Virginia, um, North Carolina, in those wintertime months, a lot of times you're going to be using a full sink line. So you're, you're, not only is your tip going to sink, but you're going to have some sort of sink rate of your uh, running line as well. Um, and that's going to make... So with, with a line like this, you're going to have what's called a belly. Um, and you're going to have a, a hinge point where your, your line is floating, and then it goes like this, and then tapers out to your fly over here. And that's cool, because if I have my running line in our shallow rocky rivers and sinking as well, well now I'm getting my running line stuck because my line, my running line is sinking faster than my buoyant fly. And now all of a sudden my line's in the rocks and oh, I'm feeling something weird, I'm feeling something weird. And then, ah, damn it, Mother Earth, right? So, um, in those other rivers where you're trying to get the fly down, what I always try to say is like, everybody says this, right? Split your difference. Let's do easy math this, I'm a fishing guy. 10 feet of water, I want my fly down 5 feet, right? Splitting the difference. So with this line, it's going to be hard to achieve anything more than 5 feet because you know, you're casting call it 50 feet, you start to retrieve it, you've only got 25 feet of line sinking. I'm not good at math, so I don't know how to totally do that whole equation for you guys, but you know, it's not going to go down as far as 
Whereas if you've got a triple density line or a line that's totally sink, the whole time you're retrieving, the line is sinking. Whereas with this line, the head is sinking, but every time you pull it, it starts to come up a little bit. Um, the full sink line stuff is really important late season. I would say spring, summer, and early fall, this is all you need. Um, as you progress uh, into winter, and you know, now that things have changed for us in the last couple years, right, where we can fish later, um, you know, you're fishing into December, you might have to go to a full sink line and start doing what I talked about earlier and getting brave with your fly and getting it down a little bit more. Um, last year, almost exclusively on intermediate lines. We had no water. We, I couldn't find a deep hole if I wanted to. So there was no way that I could be running full sink lines because I'd be hung up all the time. Um, an intermediate line, a very big key that I will tell you with intermediates is to be sparing with your material. Um, whether you're buying flies or you're tying flies, if you're buying them, look in your box and find one that's less full, right? So like um, this fly right here, you can see it looks very big this way, but if you hold it this way, it's very narrow profile. So this fly is going to get down better on an intermediate line. Whereas a fly that's tied in the round, this fly is tied in what's called like deceiver style, top and bottom. There's very minimal material on the sides of this fly. You can look, as you pull it apart, it's flash boot and that's it, right? Whereas these flies are tied in the round, which means completely around the shank and there's stuff all the way around it. This is a more buoyant fly. This fly, if you guys want to toss it around so you can kind of see what I'm saying, that fly is going to fish terribly on an intermediate line because it's too full and it's going to barely get underneath the surface, you know? Whereas this fly, which is similar size to that fly, but has less material in the body, less, it has weight in the head, this fly is going to fish way better on an intermediate line because there's less material floating it up to the surface. Now that's an okay example, like you really have to kind of pay attention to, to know the difference, but um, it's a golden. It is, yep. This fly right here has been in a bunch of fish's mouths, and you can tell by the head that I tied it on that I tied it for an intermediate line, right? That one that I just showed you guys, you can feel how thick the head is, and that's going to be more buoyant. Whereas this fly is so sparse in the head, and that changes the way that it swims, right? And this is a little bit out there to think about. But think about something like that fly back there, which has stiff fibers in the head. Very difficult to get those head fibers to move back, right? You pull it, and it's not going to move. Whereas that one, when you pull the fly, those head fibers compress back. So it gives it a different action, and it allows it to get deeper in the water column. So when you're choosing your fly to pair with your line, that's a lot that you want to think about right there. Um, I don't use a lot of lead eyes, um, whistlers, uh, clousers style type things for two reasons. One, I'm stuck on the bottom all the time. And two, if you hit a rod with that thing, it's, it's game over. But, uh, so I try to use my line to get my fly where it needs to be and adjust my flies to that line um, in that way. Now, if you're talking about, like we talked about earlier about big shanked up game changers, right? Now, this is a small game changer in the, in the world of game changers. But this fly right here, no chance. not that good on an intermediate line. Um, the way that you fish a game changer is a very long, steady strip to get that serpentine swimming. Um, whereas with those, you can, you can dance it and kind of get to do this or do whatever. You do that with these, and they don't really do as much as you would want them to do. Or do what a fly that takes you an hour and a half to tie would do. You know what I mean? If you're going to spend the time to tie one of these or spend the money to buy one of these, do it. You know, you want to fish it in a way that makes it purposeful to be to be using a, a multi-section fly like that. Um, and so, 
You know, whereas like this fly, which is probably one of my number one guide flies, getting people on fish, this single hook optimus line from Great Lakes Fly, you can buy these. Um, it's got a popper head in the body, so it keeps it up off the bottom a little bit. Now you'll see on that one, I took my pocket knife and I cut the bottom of the popper off. Um, what that does is it gives me increased hook gap, and it also um, makes it just very smidgen less buoyant, right? Um, the main reason why I do it is because that fly, well, I guess there's two hookups and when you've got a fly that's tied like this, that's tied deceiver style, this fly, if it's not swimming this way, up and down, it's not doing what it needs to do. If it starts swimming on its side, it, it, it's not right. So when you do that, it's basically keeling the fly because instead of a normal keel, like you'd see, I don't know, there's one in there, um, where there's lead wraps wrapped around the shank of the hook to make the fly stay the way it wants to. With that one, because there's flotation on the top, it does the exact same thing. It's a keel, but it's the opposite way of doing it. Um, so that fly, if you are not rhythmically stripping that fly to get it, it walks the dog under the water. It's one of the best flies on, on ever created. Uh, outside of maybe Dan Blanton's pole dancer that walks the dog like a glide like a phantom that's over there on the wall. Um, so if you're just, if you're doing big long pulls, like you're stripping a game changer with that fly, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. The same thing with a phantom, right? If you're just reeling in a phantom, it's going to kind of come in like this, and you're not going to get that big, cool, wide glide that gets them to bite it. Similar concept with flies, you know, there's a way to retrieve a bucktail, there's a way to retrieve a bulldog, there's a way to retrieve a glide bait, there's a way to retrieve a suet. All that stuff transfers over um, to, 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 to fly fishing. Um, yeah, so, any other questions? Well, I got some stuff to give away, I didn't really, I don't know how the best way to do this is, so, uh, Who's, who wears a large t-shirt?